Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 385th episode, we have a bunch of news, including a new Thyria Foran. Ooh. I think it's the coolest one since Galidosaurus, at least from the early Jurassic. That's saying something. It's super cool. And I think you also have a new ankylosaur find. It's about a skull, yes. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. That's the most important part of an ankylosaur, other than maybe the club tail, depending on how you look (laughs) at it. (laughs) We also have an interview with Jason Shine and Jason Poole, and we have Dinosaur of the Day, Dystrophius. But before we get into all of that, as always, we'd like to thank some of our patrons for helping us to keep the podcast running. And this week, we'd like to thank Verociraptor, Ermel, Eric, Evelyn and Frankie, Florida Fossil Hunter, Jonah, Mr. DNA, Remy Rodriguez, Kalosaurus Rex, and Dino Mo. Thank you so much for being uh, part of our community of dinosaur enthusiasts. We appreciate you and all of our patrons. Now, before we get into our main segment of news, I just have a quick update. We recently talked about Stan the T-Rex and how it's going to be on display at a new museum in Abu Dhabi. But it turns out Stan is already on display in Abu Dhabi. Oh, really? Yeah, the picture of it all assembled isn't just in some random warehouse. The picture that I saw of it looked like it could have just been an empty room because it was just all black behind it. Mm -hmm. But it's in a mostly black room in the current Abu Dhabi Museum of Natural History. But they're building a new museum for it as well. Oh, cool. So people can go see Stan now. I think so, yeah. It was hard to confirm exactly. I did see a video of it, though, all set up and people talking about how it was there. I haven't seen an official thing on it, but yeah, I think it's available to go see in Abu Dhabi if you're there, which is pretty awesome. Now for the new news (laughs) for this episode, the first one, because it's a new dinosaur, is going to be about this new Thyria Foran, and it was published in eLife and written by Shi Yao and others. The paleo art that they made of this new dinosaur looks quite a bit like an ankylosaur. When I first saw it, I was like, oh, they just used some random ankylosaur art, (laughs) and this is not a basal thyreophoran, because that happens a lot of the time where they need a picture for an article. I'm talking about not in the journal article itself, but, you know, on like the more mainstream sites like, oh, we need a thyreophoran. Oh, this ankylosaur picture looks nice. We'll just stick that in there. Usually they label it and it's a different dinosaur. Usually, yeah. But when I read the label, it said that it was this new dinosaur which was surprising, especially because it's so old. So its name is Yushisaurus Kopchikai, and Yushisaurus is after the Yushi prefecture where it was found, and Kopchikai is, quote, after Dr. John J. Kopchik in recognition of his contributions to biology and the IUP, which is the Indiana University of Pennsylvania Science Building, end quote. Most of the authors, including the lead author, are from China, like the fossil, but some of the authors are affiliated with the UK and US institutions, including Indiana University of Pennsylvania, which is why it got attributed that way. It's cool. I like seeing the international community working together and having that mutual respect across country boundaries. Yeah, good collaboration effort. So all in all, they found a lot of Yushisaurus. They found the right side of the skull, including parts of the brain case and the back of the jaw. They also found four articulated neck vertebrae, five back vertebrae, the shoulder blades, a humerus, a partial femur, some unidentified pieces, and more than 120 osteoderms. Wow. Yeah, I noticed in the art, they say the osteoderm arrangement is hypothetical, but it includes a lot of the types that they found. Yes, and they are very beautiful. Yeah. The osteoderms are definitely the star of the show when it comes to Yushisaurus. I like the colors they gave it, too, in the illustration. The kind of oranges and greens. Yeah, they made like the head kind of reddish, and then it gets more green as it goes back. Obviously very hypothetical. We didn't get any color details from it, but that's the fun of paleo art. You can make those sorts of leaps if you want to. They describe Yushisaurus as a, quote, medium-sized armored dinosaur, 
which I think is a good description overall for Thyria Four Ants. But for its time, I think it would have been actually pretty large, kind of like Ledumahati, you know, was a, a big sauropodomorph for its time, even though if you put it in the grand scheme of sauropods, it's fairly small. But for these early Jurassic things, there weren't a lot of big dinosaurs around. They were still pretty small overall. So being the size it was, I think actually makes it fairly large. And I couldn't resist getting a size estimate. I can never (laughs) stop myself from measuring skeletals that they don't intend to be measured (laughs) just because I always want to know, put some numbers on how big it is. From my rough approximation, it's roughly five meters or about 16 feet long. And as usual, about half of that is tail, (laughs) and we have zero of the tail or sacrum or hips. So this is really just a very rough estimate of about how long it is. But that does put it in sort of a normal, average-sized, at least, ankylosaur sort of ballpark, and probably for stegosaurs and other thyreophorans as well. We can also tell from its humerus and scapula that it probably stood higher off the ground than ankylosaurs and had a little bit more of a stegosaur type posture or other early thyreophoran posture it wasn't all hunkered down like ankylosaurs eventually were its head also looks a lot like stegosaurus it's missing the large fused osteoderms on the top of its head like later ankylosaurs had and it has a beak just like pretty much all the (laughs) thyreophorans seem to have i wish we had some ribs to see how they met with the vertebrae We assume that they probably weren't as solidly connected as later ankylosaurs were, where it's sort of one big massive unit of rib fused to vertebrae to give like a real tanky body. But we didn't find any ribs, so it's kind of a bummer. We don't know exactly how they fit together. But the vertebrae themselves don't really look like they would have had a solid attachment point for a a rib, at least not in the same way that ankylosaurs do. But again, the osteoderms are really the best part of this find, in my opinion. There are 120 of them. Unfortunately, though, all 120 of them were scattered. So we're not sure exactly what part of the body each osteoderm covered. Oh, yeah, that makes it tricky. It is very tricky. And that's usually the case outside of really interesting and specific, amazing discoveries like Zool and Borealopelta, where they happen to get fossilized in a way where it gets really beautifully preserved in place they're just i mean they're pretty small bones and they are just in the skin when it's alive so when the skin is no longer there they just move around a whole bunch and get all mixed up fortunately though comparisons to later relatives let us make some educated guesses about where these osteoderms were one of the cool types of osteoderms are the quote-unquote compound osteoderms There are seven of those that they found. Is that multiple osteoderms together? Yeah. So they're either, in this case, either three osteoderms fused together or two osteoderms fused together. So, but you know, there's seven of them. So you're up to almost 20 total osteoderms if you want to break them out individually. One of the three piece sets is about 128 millimeters or about five inches wide, which is pretty big. And they have fairly high ridges sticking off of each of those osteoderms as well it also may have had more osteoderms fused to it on the end like we see in other similar thyreophorans and they describe it as a quote partial cervical half ring end quote which we've talked a lot about cervical half rings with ankylosaurs it's basically they're a half ring because they only cover the top of the neck basically so it's the half the top half of the neck and then cervical means neck they were probably on the neck in this case you know again we don't know for sure but since they look like a cervical half ring on ankylosaurs we figure okay the ones on ushisaurus were probably also cervical half rings interestingly these osteoderms are smooth on the outside which is unusual for an early thyreophoran and so they recreated ushisaurus with an awesome spiky collar (laughs) because with that smooth surface maybe that means there was some keratin on top of it or something giving it some extra aggressive armor basically most of the rest of the osteoderms are big ovals usually with a ridge down the middle which might have had a sharp covering as well when it was alive one interesting exception though is a quote-unquote pup tent (laughs) shaped osteoderm which might have been on the tail based on some similarity to Scalidosaurus, but it could have also been from a pathology. 
obviously when you have 120 osteoderms, if they're used as armor, there's a decent chance that something bit one of them or something landed on one of them or one got otherwise injured and then grew in a sort of funny way. Yushisaurus was found in Yunnan province, China. It's in southwest China bordering Myanmar, Laos, and Vietnam. And it was found in the Fengjiahe Formation, which hasn't been dated very precisely. And that might be partially because it's a couple hundred meters thick. <laughs> so depending on which part of the formation it's found in, that makes it difficult. There also aren't as many vertebrate remains from this formation as other nearby formations. But fortunately, it has similar animals in it to the Lufeng Formation, which we know a lot more about. And based on that, it's probably very roughly 185 million years old, plus or minus about 10 million years, which is really early in the Jurassic. Yeah. Because the Jurassic started 200 million years ago, and this is right up on the earlier edge of that estimate, pretty close to that very beginning of the Jurassic. That makes Yushisaurus the very first early Jurassic Thyreophoran found in Asia, although it's not the oldest Thyreophoran in the world. Which one is? It depends on if you think something like Lesotusaurus is a Thyreophoran or not. I think Scutellosaurus is probably the earliest unambiguous Thyreophoran. That one's about 196 million years ago from Navajo Nation, Arizona. But Yushisaurus has way more armor than Scutellosaurus does. So if it's that old, it would be the oldest, like heavily armored Thyreophoran. However, if it's much more recent than that, even if it's 185 million years ago, it's probably younger than Scalidosaurus, which is kind of similar to Yushisaurus. It's around the same size. Most estimates have that one at around, I think, four meters, which is something like 13 feet. And it also has tons of armor all over it and kind of a similar head better preserved Skeletosaurus is another really awesome dinosaur but <laughs> i don't want to get too far into that in terms of what it's related to the authors say quote although the robust post cranium is similar to that of more deeply nested ankylosaurs and stegosaurs phylogenetic analysis recovers it as either the sister taxon of emausaurus or of the clade Skeletosaurus." end quote so phylogenetically, it's very close to both Scalidosaurus and Scutellosaurus. It's just outside of Ankylosauria. It's a little bit closer to Scalidosaurus. But Yushisaurus does show that in the early Jurassic, and really not that long after the very first Ornithischians, there were already Ankylosaur-looking Thyreophorans covered in really amazing armor. And it could have been just a couple million years, basically, after Ornithischians were around. I'm sure that armor came in handy. Yeah, I mean, and there weren't even that big of predators, really, at that point. So something that's 15 meters long with tons of osteoderms on it would probably have even less to worry about than later ankylosaurs did. Thyreophorans were also really widespread from the early Jurassic in North America, Africa, Europe, and Asia. Which is cool because not long ago, we thought that it took until the late Jurassic for large armor-covered Thyreophorans to evolve, and they were likely around much earlier. I mean, Scalidosaurus is sort of the weird exception, <laughs> depending on your size estimate. But it seems to reinforce that Thyreophorans weren't around in large numbers or weren't in areas that fossilize very easily because we're getting this patchwork of Thyreophorans from all over the world and with a lot of diversity really early on in their evolution, but we see them so un infrequently. They must, I, I think the hypothesis of them being pretty solitary and not in large numbers is a pretty good guess. Yeah, could be. But Yushisaurus is awesome. I think it's my favorite dinosaur of the year so far. Well, we're only in April. It's pretty early still. <laughs> That's true. In the beginning of April at that. Well, as Garrett mentioned earlier, we've got some ankylosaur news, too. Scientists rediscovered an ankylosaur skull and fossils that had been found in Queensland, Australia. This was published in Frontiers in Earth Science by Timothy Frauenfelder and others. And the fossils were found in 2005 in western Queensland. They were housed at the South Australian Museum. It's an ankylosaur skull, and ankylosaur fossils in general are rare in Australia and the southern hemisphere. Only five out of 75 known species are from Gondwana. Wow. 
Yeah. And that includes Kumbarasaurus, Minmi, Antarctopelta, Spicomelos, and Stegoros. The fossils that these authors described are the oldest ankylosaur fossils found in Queensland. They were found in a concretion, and it includes the limbs, vertebrae, armored plates, and a partial skull, and that partial skull includes teeth from the upper jaw. Nice. Yeah. They scanned the partial skull at the Australian Synchrotron in Melbourne and made 3D images, and then analyzed it and found it to be Kumbarasaurus sp. <laughs> so unknown species. Yes, but probably Kumbarasaurus. I'm surprised I couldn't tell with such a good skull. They could tell that it was Kumbarasaurus based on it having the same palate or roof of the mouth. However, the authors did note that it was not an, quote, unambiguous referral because none of the Kumbarasaurus unique features, atapomorphies, were preserved in this specimen. So they said it's a provisional referral, quote, pending further preparation and description of the postcranial skeletons. Oh, cool. So it could change in the future. Yeah. But we probably have the material available where it will change. It's not just like a big question mark that'll be unanswered forever. Right. There's more fossils to analyze, but for now they were looking at the skull. They looked at the 3D images and they analyzed the airways. Now, usually ankylosaur airways are long, they're close to the front of the snout, and they have multiple openings within the palate. And usually they also come with these complex nasal passages, so we know they had a good sense of smell, or they probably did have a good sense of smell. But with this specimen, there's only one opening on each side of the palate, and they're towards the back, which suggests that it didn't have a complex nasal system and may not have had as good a sense of smell. Hmm. The cool thing is this find may mean that Kumbarasaurus was more widespread in what is now Queensland, Australia, than previously thought. And it also may mean that Kumbarasaurus lived for more than 5 million years. And Kylosaurus everywhere, just how I like it. Yep. We have a lot of other exciting news, too. Starting with researchers recently identified a new type of hadrosaur scale. This was published in Cretaceous Research by Kaylin Libke and others. And they described hadrosaur skin from the Frenchman formation from the late Cretaceous in Saskatchewan. Was this a fossilized, like mummy type thing, or is it more of an impression situation? It was skin impressions associated with a partially disarticulated hadrosaurine skeleton, to be precise. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not like they found an actual scale. It's just an impression of a scale, unfortunately. And they've tentatively referred to it as uh, Edmontosaurus anectens. And we tend to find more hadrosaur skin that's been preserved compared to other types of dinosaurs. It's unclear why. Edmontosaurus skin is one of the best known skins of dinosaurs, and the scale structure and the patterning have been described for most of its body. But for this specimen, the skin impressions come mostly from the pelvic region, and they have, quote, unique corrugated scales. This helps show that there's more diversity in scales and more intraspecific variation in hadrosaurid skin. So this patch of skin impression was about 25 centimeters long, 15 centimeters wide, and it had two types of scales, small pebbly scales that form narrow bands between clusters of, quote, larger, roughly polygonal, corrugated scales, and the clusters are irregularly shaped. Now, I know I said that this could show more intraspecific variation in hadrosaurid skin, but this variation could be due to geographical variation and you see differences between the same species of dinosaur the authors also said well maybe it's sexual dimorphism but that's really difficult to test so it's hard to say or it could be that the different scales help the dinosaurs tell each other apart from different species one of those things you'd notice if you were another hadrosaur but you probably wouldn't notice if you were another type of animal yeah exactly Based on that partially disarticulated skeleton, they estimate the specimen to be 75% the size of larger, quote, presumably gr fully grown individuals. 
So it's estimated to be the size of a subadult, but the histology suggests that it was actually a mature specimen. So it's just a little smaller. Yeah. Now it's unclear if the unique traits then are individual variation of a species or variation among different species. And it's not known if the smaller body size and having those distinct scales are related features. Yeah, because if we were looking at bones and we said, oh, it's got different bones in a way, and they look a little bit different, and it's an adult and it's smaller than the adults of a similar species, we'd probably name it a new species. Yeah. But we don't usually do that based on skin impressions. Basically, they need to find more complete specimens to know for sure. The author said that there's not skull material associated with this specimen, and the unique features of Edmontosaurus are on the skull, so they can't confirm for sure either that this specimen is Edmontosaurus anectans. They've just tentatively assigned it for now. A lot of tentative assigning happening. Mm -hmm. Just need more fossils, then we can better compare. Now this next item has to do with sauropod skin. <laughs> Lots of skin. Yeah. Plus I like to have sauropod items when I can. It's usually not hard. <laughs> yeah. This study was done by Michael Pittman and others and published in Communications Biology. And the team re-examined Hastosaurus skin, it's a type of sauropod, and found scales and structures that looked somewhat like goosebumps. Hmm. They're also known as papillae. They used laser imaging on a rock sample found in 1852 near Hastings in England, and that rock sample was found next to the fossils of Hastosaurus. So they think they go together. And they found convex scales on one side of the block and smaller, more flattened scales on the other side of the block. Sauropod skin is usually found isolated and or fragmentary and only found in small patches. And often it's hard to tell where on the body those patches came from. But in this case, they think most likely the scales were on the left forelimb. Well, that's very specific. It's possible that the structures, those goosebump-like structures, helped sauropods regulate body heat by increasing the surface area and keeping them cool. And it's also possible that there's a link between these structures on the skin and sauropods getting bigger. Hmm. Meaning like they could dissipate more heat using the bumps? Exactly. So they can get bigger? It is a big question how you stay cool when you're that big <laughs> in a warm environment especially. Yes. Also, another piece of news that came out recently is that a team of researchers found a griposaurus bone bed in the Ullman Formation in Alberta, Canada. This was published in Canadian Journal of Earth Science by Evan Scott and others. Unfortunately, we didn't have access to this one, so I'll only be discussing the abstract. But it's the oldest hadrosauroid bone bed found so far in Alberta, and they found that all the specimens were juveniles, with some under one years old and some under two years old when they died, and they probably all died in the same event. It seems that they were only transported a short distance from where they died to where they were buried. And it could be that they were a segregated group of juveniles. Maybe they separated themselves from a larger group. Or they were crossing a stream or something and only the little ones got swept away. Could be. It's hard to tell from just the abstract. <laughs> Well, it's also just hard to tell in general, even if, <laughs> you know, if you find all these ones and it's clear that they all died together at, and they're around the same age, you don't know why. True. Now, last pieces of news have to do with a few documentaries that are coming out or actually in one case recently came out. Now that it's Jurassic World season, everybody's releasing <laughs> new dinosaur content. Yeah, although these have been in the works for a while, but. It is nice that they all line up. I'm sure it's not a coincidence. <laughs> yeah, probably not. <laughs> now, the first one, and this one has been making lots of headlines, is Sir David Attenborough's latest documentary series, Prehistoric Planet, which debuts on May 23rd. Yeah, that one looks amazing. Oh, yeah, the trailer is great. It looks like a nature documentary. It's going to feature dinosaurs from the Cretaceous 66 million years ago. There was a 30-second teaser and a two-minute sneak peek that came out. And you see a baby T-Rex with downy feathers hunting baby turtles, and then a father T-Rex taking care of the baby. 
You can also see a herd of sauropods, polar dinosaurs, and prehistoric animals in the skies and the water. Yeah, I think it's the closest thing to a recreation of walking with dinosaurs that everybody's been talking about for a long time. You know, wanting to see with the latest and greatest CGI what they could do. And it looks really amazing. I think it's been in the works for two to three years, too. It's produced by John Favreau, Mike Gunton, and BBC. And it's going to be on Apple TV. They're going to release one episode a day the week of the 23rd. Oh, nice. We might be busy that week, depending on what goes on with babies. But right. <laughs> I guess we could we could sneak in some watching dinosaur shows, hopefully. <laughs> we can try, yeah. <laughs> Maybe during nap times. Yeah. That sounds so cool. I, I couldn't believe the beginning of it because you see this little turtle crawling or a bunch of turtles. And I thought, okay, they shot these turtles in real life mm-hmm. with a camera. And then they're going to add in like composite in dinosaurs. But the dinosaur is interacting enough with the turtles that I think it's CGI and it's just gotten to a point now where it's completely indistinguishable. Yeah. That CGI of like a turtle and every grain of sand moving. It's, yeah, things have come a long way. Really pretty. Yeah. I can't wait. (laughs) Well, there is also another David Attenborough documentary coming out even sooner. (laughs) (laughs) It's going to be on BBC. It's called Dinosaurs the Final Day, airing April 15th. We talked about this one before, but it wasn't until recently I knew when to expect it. Although, you can watch it if you're in the UK, I think April 15th. And then later in the year, it's going to be on PBS Nova. Cool. Is this the one about the Tainus site? Yes. And they spent three years filming. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's about how long ago we learned about the Tainus site. Mm Mm-hmm. It includes some specimens that possibly were killed and buried on the day that the asteroid hit, and that's based on limb positions in the sediments. But there's already some debate on this since it hasn't been peer-reviewed, so maybe there's more papers that'll be coming out in the future. Yeah, I'm not a a huge fan of making a documentary without doing a peer-review paper on it first because the public is really going to, a lot of people are going to watch this and think that it's a settled you know, science has settled on it. This is what we think happened exactly before anybody really had a chance to talk about it, which is kind of a bummer. They did have a number of consultants, paleontology consultants. Yeah, but it's a peer review process. You can't really skip it. I thought you were going to say it was about the fish because the fish part has been peer reviewed with the spherule stuck in the gills and all that that we think got killed by it. But the fish is in it. But you're talking about limb positions and the fish don't have that. So definitely something else. In particular, there's this one short clip I saw with a fossil leg. It looks really well preserved. Mm. You can see the details on the toes and the scales. And it's from a probably a Theskelosaurus. That's a Neo-Ornithischian. It's a small bipedal dinosaur with a long ankle and shin. So in addition to those discoveries and the fish, Attenborough is going to talk about a fossil turtle skewered by a wooden stake. Mm. It avoided the sauropod this time. You know, it's, first of all, sauropods, it's probably by accident whenever that did happen. <laughs> whenever they skewered them and with steaks. turtles die of all different causes. <laughs> That's true. We were just talking about the T-Rex trying to eat the baby turtles. Yes. Anyway, he'll also talk about the small mammals and the burrows that they're found in, skin from a triceratops, a pterosaur embryo, and a fragment from the asteroid impactor. And that documentary is going to be about an hour and a half long. We've talked a bit about the Tainus site, too, and the latest study that the asteroid likely hit in the spring back in episode 377. And the lead author of that study was Robert De Palma, who is involved in this documentary. I just wish it was peer-reviewed. Would be nice. Yeah, I'm sure it'll still be informative and pretty. And eventually there's probably going to be more papers about this. Yeah, I just hope the science doesn't change too much because once the cat's out of the bag, it's hard to get people, you know, sort of like the T-Rex can see motion. Mm -hmm. People still get questions about that 30 years later. (laughs) True. But I am hopeful since there were a number of paleontologists who were consulted on this. Okay, good. Now, last, BBC has another documentary called (laughs) Fantastic Beasts and Natural History, and that one is out now. 
You can watch it on BBC One and HBO Max, so a couple options. In this documentary, Stephen Fry looks at the stories behind some of the most fantastic beasts in the world, and that includes dinosaurs, and how some cultures used to think dinosaurs were fictitious, or, you know, like mythical dragons. In that segment, it's pretty cool. They visit the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry, and they talk a bit about Allosaurus. And then, if you watch the whole thing, other fantastic beasts in the show include the Kraken, Loch Ness Monster, Unicorns, Hippogriff, and Mermaids. Mermaids are probably the funniest one of the bunch, in terms of the likely origin. Manatees. It's usually what they say. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's true. I always like the Loch Ness Monster stories. Yeah. And shortly, we're going to get on to our interview with the Jasons. But real quick, I'm going to pause for a sponsor break. And now we're going to get on to our interview. But before we do, as always, just want to mention, we have an extended version of this interview and if you're a patron, you can get that from your premium content feed. We're joined this week by Jason Shine, who is the author, and Jason Poole, who's the illustrator of Dinosaurs Behaving Badly, a coloring book that is also full of the latest information about dinosaur behavior. Jason Shine is also the founder of the nonprofit Bighorn Basin Paleontological Institute, dedicated to paleontology and earth science research, education, and outreach. And Jason Poole is a paleo artist whose work has been featured in National Geographic, scientific publications, and museums. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks Thank for, having for having us. So what inspired you to create Dinosaurs Behaving Badly? We, we were both hungry and uh, <laughs> needed a little money. No, it's a, uh, this is a, the second uh, coloring book in the series, and it is everything that we learned by the mistakes from the first one. <laughs> so in the second one, that's been a, applied. Uh, there's some full color illustrations in there. There's some great dinosaurs, some dinosaurs that aren't really well known. And then of course, you know, everything that, that Jason's written, I think really kind of makes this a great coloring book for kids and adults and adults with kids. Mm -hmm. Because if you read what Jason wrote, you're all of a sudden the expert and your kid now thinks you're cool again. <laughs> <laughs> They're not the ones telling you how to pronounce all the names and all the facts about them and everything. <laughs> exactly. Paul and I are always talking about and throwing ideas back and forth about books we should write together and themes and topics to hit. And this is actually one we came up with quite a while ago, right after the first one came up. And then we just got busy. Couldn't get around to it for, I don't know, two or three years, pool maybe at least. And yeah. then um, finally, I don't know, the stars aligned a few months ago, maybe half a year ago. And we just said, hey, let's just finish it, knock it out. It really touches on two things that I am really passionate about. Dinosaurs and paleontology, obviously, but just modern nature too. I just I grew up watching all those documentaries when the Discovery Channel actually had something worth watching when I was a kid. <laughs> Um, and you know, nature on PBS and stuff like that. I loved learning about nature and observing the behavior. And then my grandfather was a, was an animal behaviorist a long time ago. So I always just loved that and wanted to incorporate a lot of, of that kind of information in this book and how it helps inform us about how dinosaurs probably behaved and, and sometimes vice versa. Nice. How did you, so I guess maybe we should go back to the first one. Was that your first collaboration or have you been working together on projects for a long time? Well, we've been working together in the field and in, in paleontology since 2005 when I first moved to Philly and met Pool. But these are the only two books we've written so far. We have about 20 ideas <laughs> <laughs> that are in some stage of a completeness at this point. But we've been working together and been buds since 20, 2005. Nice. We actually worked uh, digging up Dreadnoughtus in Argentina, which is a, a great, great dinosaur. I think the best part of, of that dinosaur is that it's probably the first dinosaur that I've been involved in the naming in or of that actually has a name that kids will remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So uh, the first one, and this is really fun because this, this takes us back to where Jason Shine and I are digging in Montana, and that dinosaur's name is Suawasia, and I can I can barely spell it. 
So I, I don't think there's a lot of kids that are like, so was he's my favorite. <laughs> um, but uh, then Doug, uh, also in, in Egypt for Paralatitan. So Dreadnoughtus is kind of a welcome kid hook dinosaur, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, Dreadnoughtus. And I think its name alone is part of the reason it got a lot of press because it's such oh, a yeah. cool... Fear nothing. Yeah, and it's also, isn't it related? Is there a boat that's sort of affiliated, like a Dreadnought ship? Or was that not really part of the inspiration? This is something that sort of Ken Lacavera threw in there late, and we were all like, what? <laughs> but um, we all just liked the name. Fear is nothing. It's just, you know, when you talk about something that size, I always mess with him. He said, he said fear is nothing, and I said, except gravity. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he was like you're not allowed to talk to the press so. <laughs> that's pretty good mm-hmm. yeah that would have been a species name maybe you could get like accept gravity as the <laughs> species <name. laughs> that's awesome so you've as a paleo artist you've gotten to go on a lot of digs all over the place has that informed your paleo art as well yeah it, it's sort of um my first love is art, but my very, very close second love is excavation and exploration. Hmm. And I was very, very lucky as a fossil preparator, which was my job at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. I was very lucky to work with people that were doing very exciting projects and they needed somebody who could assess sort of what fossils needed to, to be excavated soundly. So I got dragged, dragged to a bunch of different <laughs> places and loved every minute of it. As a young guy, I hadn't really left Philadelphia very much. So so traveling and, and going to places that were just very different, part of the allure. But when you're out in the field, you're working with a bunch of people that have the same kind of passions that you do. So it's just sort of a great way to get work done, but also just sort of spend time with, with other, you know, really fun people. Or at least people that have the same disease you do, you know, <laughs> as, as far as you know, paleontology goes. Yeah, so I come at osteology from an art background. It's it's a weird thing. Here in Missoula, I, I just finished teaching a course on illustrating animal skulls. So it's uh, bones and art are a big part of my life. Yeah. So you guys work together a little bit at the New Jersey State Museum. That is where I worked for ten years. Poole worked at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philly. Long story, lots of twists and turns, but for a few years, I was a PhD student under Dr. Lacabera, uh, working on Dreadnoughtus. And we worked very closely with Poole. His team helped lead the preparation of that dinosaur. Obviously, Poole was there to help with the excavation and just living nearby. We had a lot in common. So we've been working on a lot of things together for, for quite a while. And then post-grad school and, and post Dreadnoughtus work, a lot of my work was in um, southern New Jersey in one of those big fossil pits, essentially. And, and all of those fossils went to pool in his lab to be prepared. So we worked together with that. Ever since we started going out to Montana, working now more than 10 years ago, pool has been a part of that excavation. So really all of my paleontological work since I moved to Philly in 2005 uh, pool's been involved with wow that's awesome i didn't realize this is going to sound insulting to new jersey and i hate to do that because i love new jersey but i didn't realize the new jersey state museum had a big fossil preparation ability associated with it is that where you're doing the work they don't so all of the bones i brought to pool at the academy he prepared them when they were ready i brought them back to the to the state museum gotcha nice. okay now I, I feel better. I don't. I don't like besmirching the good name of New Jersey. <laughs> Although you guys are in Philly, so you probably don't mind. <laughs> yeah, what good name? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we have to, we have to give Dave a shout out. I mean, he he sort of set up what we uh, base a lot of sort of the field activities on. We've grown quite a bit since then. But Dave Paris is a great guy. He's at New Jersey State Museum and was uh, Jason's boss for a while. And you guys also, you work together on the Leaping Laylaps, amazing sculpture, sort of recreation of a really famous piece of art. Could you tell us a little about how that got started? Sure. So unfortunately for the almost the entire 
time I was at the State Museum for 10 years, the Natural History Hall was closed. When I got there, it was closed. And my last accomplishment and job while there was to get the hall back open. It wasn't completely renovated and it wasn't the grand exhibition that we wanted it to be, but we did what we could with what we had. And the best part of that that I was most proud of was getting a cast of Dryptosaurus made and mounted, but in the pose of Leaping Lay Labs. Mm -hmm. And Dryptosaurus has never been mounted before, at least not since, you know, the Coke days or anything like that. Certainly no one alive has ever seen it mounted. And I thought, what better way to have it mounted than the in that pose? So we got two of them and had them, and they're, they're skeletal mounts, um, and had them posed just like you see uh, in the illustration. So I was pretty happy with that. It, it's a pretty cool part of the whole Natural History Hall. Yeah, I think it looks amazing. Mm-hmm. We haven't seen it in person because I seen, think that was after we moved. But we've yeah, seen pictures. Yeah, and that alone is like we got to get back to that museum. That looks awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it is cool. I mean, the the grander vision was to recreate the entire environment around it, everything you see in that painting. But you know, like I said, we did what we could with what we had. Yeah, I you know it, it's funny. Like a lot of things, you know, it, it starts out with Shine going, "Hey, what do you think of this? Can you draw me a picture of that?" And then, you know, we do that and then from there, just see where it'll go. And it, it's, uh, we've had a lot of fun successes. And I, I really like what they were able to, to get together. And I don't know, I, I think the mount itself is so stunning that without a lot of stuff to sort of take away from it, that may have been the way to go. So that's kind of nice to see from an artistic mm-hmm. point of view. You know, I, I think that that was the way to go. Yeah. So. See, I don't, I don't have an artistic cell in my body, so any artistic type decisions like this, <laughs> I just leave up to pool. So yeah. it's totally fine. The, I think the best thing about those murals is they sort of tell you when it was mounted because you can tell by the the picture, like how are they putting the skin on the bones? Okay, the bones themselves don't tell you that, unless it's in like a kangaroo pose or something. You could tell it's really old, but if otherwise, yeah, the mural sometimes is the best way to tell. I love looking at, uh, you know, old coloring books and stuff like that that I used to have as a kid and all the still in the water brontosaurus, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> that kind of thing. So, but I love them because they, they do, they speak to the history of what we knew. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So speaking of coloring books, how'd you decide which dinosaurs and which behaviors to include in yours? That went back and forth. I did a lot of illustrations ahead of time because I'm always kind of doing stuff. And then I showed him the shine. Some of them, he was like, hey, yeah, we can talk about this with this or this with this. And then he would say, I'd also like to include a bit on this and this and this and this. And then I come up with uh, stuff to fit that. So our collaboration is often pretty loose. And then at the end of it, shine takes the whole caboodle and, um, (laughs) sort of lays it all out and figures out, okay, we still need something for this. We still need something for this, or let's get a brand new this because it would really round things out. Hmm. I'm kind of scatterbrained and and living in my art world. And he's a little bit more firmly attached to the for really real world. <laughs> and uh, he sort of reigns the project in, which I really appreciate, you know. Some things just stick in the back of my mind and some things just jump out at you as being obvious. And that's kind of the starting points like pachycephalosaurs with those domed heads, whether they ram them together, like bighorn sheep or not, you can't not talk about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Burrowing dinosaurs always stuck out to me because they don't get a lot of attention. And that's kind of one of the themes in the, in the book is to say, look, we see these behaviors in modern nature today, where in dinosaurs, what might we see that also and vice versa. So some things like that just jump out at you and they automatically are going to go in there. As Poole said, he has some illustrations kind of pre-ready to go and I'll take a look at those and, and you know, the gears start turning and, and you start thinking of new things. It's kind of a combination of all that. Yeah. I really liked like the Bambi Raptor and the dust bath. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. you know, that's one of my favorites too. Poole really had some fun uh, with some of these and put them in poses and behaviors that you just didn't think about or wouldn't have thought about before. And yeah, there were a lot of really fun ones like that. Yeah, like a chicken, big chicken. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. 
So I think one of you was it I think Shine, you were saying your grandpa or your dad was a behavior. What did you learn from him? My father's father was an animal behaviorist and he was a pretty amazing guy. He did work in the Arctic on polar bears. If I remember his stories correctly, he and his team were the first people to try to use tranquilizers on animals to, you know, put them down, study them, let them wake up naturally and go back to doing their thing. Except they decided to first try out this new technology on polar bears. (laughs) They had no idea how much tranquilizer to give these polar bears. They would, they would dart them, run up as quickly as they could when it was safe. He always told me they had some crazy Texan with them who would hog tie the the polar bears, oh my gosh. get their measurements as fast as possible, and then get the hell out of there because they had no idea how fast they would wake up, when they would wake up, and if they would be torn to shreds or not. And I, I've been trying to digitize old pictures and videos lately, you know, the, the, the film reels that are very perky jerky and, and have no sound. And I found some of those old videos of him in the Arctic. I think they were the first ones to video polar bears swimming from from underneath the water proving that they don't use their hind limbs or do i don't remember obviously (laughs) i should i should have paid more attention to him either way he did a lot of amazing stuff like that and all over the world and for his whole career so partly animal behavior has always fascinated me because of him and his adventures but also it's just i just always love being in nature and i love i love learning and knowing why things are doing the things that they're doing it's not just random there's reason behind it and i feel like i mean you can love nature and get to know nature but when you start knowing why a pika is making that sound or anything else like that then you've you've gotten to this extra layer of being a part of nature that i really really like awesome yeah so pool how did it go from art to into paleontology for you since you said art started slightly before I'm very severely dyslexic. So as a kid, I had a lot of trouble in school. And I think sometimes I just sort of drift off and do my own thing and start sketching and drawing and stuff like that. But that was my first positive sort of experience in school when people were going, hey, you know, you can actually draw. You're not a complete waste of human being, <laughs> <You know? laughs> which, which is kind of what kids hear, you know? Yeah. Like, uh, at the time, I was drawing a lot of sort of stuff from comic books, and I, I love I love comic books. I love the quality of line. I love all that stuff. I love the attention to anatomy. You know, just the amount of stuff comic book artists have to know on an instinctual level is really intense. It's really cool. But they were also doing like X Men in the Savage Land at the time, which hmm. was like a dinosaur kind of holdover. And so I started drawing dinosaurs. And was realizing I really like drawing dinosaurs. So I, I drew dinosaurs a lot. Eventually started working at a natural history museum and was being asked to do illustrations of dinosaurs. And, you know, it was just something that sort of happened. But a lot of preparators, fossil preparators, are also people that come from a sort of visual background. So you really have to have a good sense for negative space materials, that kind of stuff. So basically, you're looking at artists uh, as technicians. So I had been doing fossil preparation since I was a kid. My dad used to take us out fossil collecting. So I went and volunteered at the museum and learned how to do it right, and then got hired by the museum as an educator, and then hired by the museum to run their fossil preparation lab, which had a big part in designing. So I kept walking through open doors. You know, anybody that's doing this kind of thing, you know, open that door. If there's something you need to learn, go learn it. I think that's the biggest thing that I'll always be grateful for was I had people like Peter Dodson inviting me to sit in on graduate seminars and take place in graduate. So one of my biggest failings was the first time I presented for Peter and his students on a group of animals, totally just my my binder of slides just went everywhere. You know, it was just this horrible experience. But I realized that's really what I wanted to be doing. So, you know, fought through it and then did more. And so those kind of open doors, just take them. You know, and if they're not right, you know pretty soon you take another open door. 
Yeah, some good advice. Yeah. And the the most recent open door is you are now in Montana. Yeah, Missoula, Montana. And it's great. They have a really wonderful art community here. I've been teaching for the ZAC, which is the Zoo Town Arts Community Center or something like that. But they're terrific. And, you know, I hope to continue with that. Been doing my own online classes. Uh, we have one coming up, which is drawing feathered dinosaurs. Fun. And then during the summer, I have an actual job where I go out and I help dig up and educate and do stuff in Red Lodge with uh, the BBPI and Shine. Nice. Are you guys both still working on the Mother's Day, Corey? We are. We spend uh, two days a week there generally and three days a week at another location that's only a few miles away, but has dramatically different landscape and paleontological situations. But yeah, the Mother's Day site is still producing, much to the chagrin of some folks, but it keeps us busy. <laughs> who would who would object to there still being <laughs> things coming out? Well, uh, <laughs> since it's down in a bowl, it's a bit like an oven. Oh, um, I see. It could get a bit hotter than some of our other sites. And also... The people who house the fossils that we bring back, you know, no museum in the world has plenty of space. <laughs> so uh, when we keep bringing them back bones from a site that's already yielded thousands of bones, uh, I'm not sure we're making any friends. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be your friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The more bones from the same quarry, the better. You get such a better picture of like the biology and the details of the animals. Like, yeah, it's fun finding new dinosaurs in new places and you learn something about a new animal. But really that the information about the animals and how they lived. Absolutely. Yeah. It's still producing new science. If it wasn't, we wouldn't be there. But um, yeah, we've still we've got a number of projects ongoing right now and, and you never know what the next find will will turn up. That's what's exciting to me is you know, we, we keep finding the same type of dinosaur over and over and over and over again. So it's a very strange site. So far, it's all juvenile diplodocus, right? It is. Yep. And they're preserved well enough so that in some cases, we're still seeing mummified skin imprint and that sort of thing. That is awesome. Yeah. The more of that, the better. <laughs> Agreed. Except that you have to do it in an oven. That's unfortunate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not always so bad. And uh, it's less distant from base camp so it's a little bit less time in the car and that's always welcome but it's not so bad it's a beautiful site cool so do you have the upcoming books we literally just finished this one a couple months ago maybe three months ago and we're coming up on field season which means things are really really busy as i mentioned we're, we're always tossing around ideas we haven't really started on the next one we're the dad jokes one <laughs> oh yeah, who wants to do one dinosaur related dad joke? I like how you say pool wants to do it. <laughs> I want to do like all paleo. Like we have this one for TikTok that like if I can remember it, it'd be like TikTok dragged itself on land to find a tic tac to lick. So it's like <laughs> like these things, but they're really hard to come up with. Like I feel like we we should just put up a a, a little thing on our website that says like if you have a great dad joke, because I'm I'm sitting here and I've come up with like two. And I'm a dad jokeaholic. <laughs> TikTok licking a tic tac is wonderful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I used to uh, tease Ted Deschler, who's one of the authors for for TikTok, and I used to call it tic tac a lick. And he's like, "Come on, it's not that hard." You know. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Just switching gears real quick. Jason Shai, can you tell us a little bit about the Bighorn Basin Paleontological Institute? Sure. So we opened our doors about five years and one month ago. And essentially what we do, our main program is in the summer, we invite people from all over the country and, and get people from all over the world to come to Southern Montana with us and spend a week or however long they want, um, helping us find and excavate dinosaurs. And the first few years, we focused on the Lance Formation, which is kind of an equivalent of the Hell Creek Formation. So all those latest Cretaceous dinosaurs you would expect. Long story short, we got a great opportunity to go check out a site, actually the site of uh, the first Suawasia, where Jason 
helped excavate in, in 1999 and 2000, just out of sheer coincidence. And that's in the Morrison Formation. And um, that area has not stopped throwing dinosaurs at us. Mm. Um, <laughs> even if we wanted to go back to the Cretaceous, we couldn't because every time before we finish up any project, we have found three new sites. <laughs> Um, and that's not an exaggeration. It, it's just dinosaur after dinosaur after dinosaur. So obviously a great problem to have. Mm -hmm. So anyway, these folks from all over the world come and help us find and excavate dinosaurs. And they learn all about the process, obviously, but also about the Morrison ecosystem and paleontology in general and, and regional geology. And then one night a week, we take them. We, so in the evenings, we usually have a class, one of those topics I just mentioned. And on Wednesday nights, we take a break and we take them up onto the Beartooth Pass. So we're having snowball fights in August at 11,000 feet. <laughs> and Friday nights is the last night and we take them to a local saloon and steakhouse for a good meal if they want it. But just as importantly, there are pig races behind. <laughs> it's a fundraiser for local students for to go to college for scholarships. But it's both people watching and pig race watching. It's a lot of fun. But the program, it, it's amazing. It's really a, a wonderful experience. Now, anywhere from 30 to 40% of the people who come are repeats. And we have some people who have come five and six times now. And we, as part of this, we also have a three-credit college course through uh, Montana State University Billings. Every year, we have a Make-A-Wish kid come out and his family or her family. So far, it's all been boys. And so we just incorporate as many different ways to enjoy this experience and learn about all this stuff as possible in, in a lot of different settings. And we stay in this camp that was started almost 90 years ago on the side of a mountain just outside of Red Lodge. Mm. That's just intensely beautiful. So anyway, it's an amazing experience. It's in a beautiful, beautiful place. And I mean, obviously I'm going to talk it up, but it really is an amazing. Yeah. You sound like you're about ready to go back. <laughs> I'm, you know, I tell my wife every year at the end of the season, it gets harder and harder to point my truck east in <laughs> Montana. And um, one of these days it may not happen. That's <laughs> <laughs> what happened to I, me. I, it's preparing for the field season and what takes up most of my time the rest of the year. But yeah, every minute I'm not there, I'm, I'm thinking about it and can't wait to get back. Awesome. Yeah. That's amazing. I feel like just hearing that, there's going to be some people that are like, I want to do paleontology. Well, that was going to be my next question then for our listeners. If they want to learn about uh, both of you and your work and, and also the Bighorn Basin Paleontological Institute, where's the best place for them to go? Well, for, for me, uh, there's jasoncpool.com. It's so weird. I, I'm now a .com. It's crazy. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but luckily I have people who do. We should say there's an E at the end of pool too, just in case it's not obvious. So you can do that, but you know, I'm also, there's a little bit about me on the Bighorn Basin Paleo site, uh, which Jason Shine will tell you more about. I'm kind of all over the place. So, but the jasoncpool.com is the place to check it out. Pool with an E. Awesome. Take your advice. <laughs> yep. And for the BBPI, it's pretty simple. It's just bbpaleo.org. We are already 12% full for next year and already have people signed up for 2024. So don't wait. We fill up earlier every single year. But there's a lot of good information. And we've got some exciting news about the organization coming out in a couple of months. So, so do check out the website often and, and stay tuned. Awesome. That's great. And then also, if anybody wants to order their own copy of Dinosaurs Behaving Badly, that's available May 3rd. So you can pre-order and we'll make sure to have a link to the book and also a link to all of these websites on our show notes. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you guys both so much for joining us. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks again, Jason and Jason, for the great interview. We really appreciate all the work that went into your book. It's super cool. And we didn't mention it during the interview, but 25% of the proceeds for the coloring book go to the BBPI. So if you want to support paleontology and get a coloring book, you can combine those into one purchase. It's a win-win. And a win-win-win because <laughs> we're helping people do it. <laughs> and in a moment, we'll get into our dinosaur of the day, Dystrophius. But before that, 
We're going to pause for one more quick sponsor break. And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Dystrophius, which was a request from PaleoMike716 via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. Dystrophius was a sauropod that lived in the late Jurassic and what is now Utah in the U.S. in the Morrison Formation. It looked like other sauropods. It walked on all fours. It had the long neck and the long tail. It's estimated to weigh about 12 tons. The type species is Dystrophius via male. It was described in 1877 by Edward Cope, and the genus name means coarse joint. Hmm. It refers to the pitted joint surfaces on the limb bones that attached cartilage. The species name means of the bad road, and it refers to how hard it was to reach and excavate the fossils. <laughs> sort of like an irritator type name. Yeah, exactly. A partial skeleton was found, including a humerus, scapula, part of the radius, and some metacarpals. And these fossils were found in 1859 by John Strong Newbury. It was the first sauropod described from North America. In 1877, Cope said that Dystrophius was a Triassic dinosaur, but gave no other details. Then in 1882, Henri Amel Savage said that it was a sauropod. And then in 1895, Marsh said that it was a stegosaur. In 1904, Friedrich von Huhn thought that it was an herbivorous theropod, and then in 1908 reclassified it as a sauropod. Wow. So it started out as a Triassic dinosaur, then sauropod, then stegosaur, then back to sauropod. Then theropod, then sauropod. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dystrophius was herbivorous. I mentioned it was estimated to weigh 12 tons. There was another estimate that found it to weigh about the same as an elephant, which can weigh about 13,000 pounds or 5,900 kilograms. The fossils were found on a steep canyon hillside in hard rock by Newberry, who made the sketches, hence the difficulty in excavating. Newberry was a geologist on the Engineer Exploring Expedition under Captain McComb from the U.S. Army doing a survey around the Colorado and Green Rivers. And actually going back, at first they thought the fossils were from an ichthyosaur. They couldn't properly excavate the fossils, so they left most of the bones there for a future geologist. They did take a few, though. They had to scale the steep cliff and then hike to the fossils. Now, according to Cope, the fossils were found, quote, in close proximity, the bones of the limb in nearly normal relation, end quote. Some paleontologists think dystrophius may be a nomum dubium, but not everybody agrees. The fossils are just too indeterminate, so that can be hard to tell. The site where it was found was lost for a while, but then in the 1970s, Fran Barnes went looking for it and in 1988 found a site that fit the description, and that turned out to be the original Dystrophius quarry site. In 2014, Dystrophius Project was launched to find more fossils. It was a collaboration between the Museum of Moab, Natural History Museum of Utah, and the Bureau of Land Management, and they excavated even more fossils in 2017. Ooh, they found them. Yeah. That was quick. 2014, they started. In 2017, they already excavated them. It took a long time to find, though. There's a cast of a dystrophious forelimb on display at the Museum of Moab, too. And for our fun fact, it's a couple of fun facts combined. I couldn't help myself on this one. <laughs> I pulled a Garrett. <laughs> yeah, it happens. Turns out a combination of volcanic activity and climate change led to the mass extinction at the end of the Triassic, which led to the rise of dinosaurs. It also turns out that climate plays a large role in where animals live and thrive. As an example, sauropods needed to live in warmer environments compared to other dinosaurs. Yep, you don't find them near the poles. Exactly. So I'll talk first about the volcanic activity and climate change. Kunio Kaiho and others published about this in Earth and Planetary Science Letters. And as we know, the end of the Triassic, it's one of five big mass extinctions. It happened around 201 million years ago. And at the end of the Triassic, Pangaea broke up due to volcanic activity. But that isn't necessarily enough to explain the mass extinction event. So this team examined sedimentary rocks from that time that were collected in Austria and England. And they looked at the high levels of hydrocarbons, specifically coronine, in the rocks. And they heated the rocks, and they studied the gases that were produced. They found at low temperature heating, there was 
a lot of sulfur dioxide that was produced. And then at high temperature heating, there was a lot of carbon dioxide. This suggests that at the end of the Triassic, the volcanic activity first led to low temperature heating that released a lot of sulfur dioxide from the rocks. The sulfur dioxide reflected sunlight and prevented plants from photosynthesizing, and that made Earth colder. And it seems that that cold weather is what caused the mass extinction. Then after the mass extinction, things heat up more, and there was high temperature heating, which released a lot of carbon dioxide from the rocks, and that led to global warming. So when it was cold, the larger animals went extinct, and then the dinosaurs were able to grow bigger and reign for many years, until, of course, the Cretaceous, the end of the Cretaceous. The author said that the amount of coronine can help analyze mass extinction events, so other mass extinction events, and it can help show the temperature changes that happen from volcanism that change the climate. For example, low levels of coronine indicate low temperature heating, which correlates to initial extinctions in you see in the water and also the land ecosystems collapsing. Now, somewhat related to this study was another study that found that sauropods could only live in warm environments. I see. So this is all good news for the sauropods. <laughs> it was, yeah. They did do well. This was published by Alfio Alessandro Chiarenza and others in Current Biology. Emma Doon also wrote about the study in Current Biology, an article called Paleobiogeography, Why Some Sauropods Liked It Hot. Yeah. I like that title. <laughs> Now, the team analyzed fossils from throughout the Mesozoic, and they looked at sauropods, theropods, and ornithischians. They looked at data of the fossils and data about the climate. They found that by the end of the Jurassic, quote, dinosaurs had achieved a pole-to-pole -pole distribution, which was retained until their demise at the end of the Cretaceous, end quote. And they also found that sauropods consistently occupied warmer, drier habitats compared to other dinosaurs. Sauropods tended to be found in semi-arid environments, similar to today's savannas. And sauropod finds are rare, if not absent, from high paleo latitudes. So no sauropods have been found above a latitude of 50 degrees north or below 65 degrees south. Wow, 65 degrees south is pretty far. Yeah. Although things move over time. That's probably the current latitude. <laughs> Maybe not back then. I think it was mostly just hasn't they haven't been found in antarctica mm. these colder polar regions just weren't good for sauropods it could be that they were capable of living in these high latitude environments but they just weren't as good at it as other dinosaurs and they could have been out competed for food also the way their nests form and you know potentially burying them they can't sit on their nests so they need the ground to be fairly warm exactly it could be a big problem and the sun to be shining on them Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you go through a couple months of winter, that's trouble. Mm-hmm. With a capital T. They did mention that the, quote, limited nature of the late Cretaceous African dinosaur record, end quote, means there's not enough data to figure out patterns there. They need more fossils. The way sauropods were distributed, though, is similar to crocodilomorphs. And with crocodilomorphs, temperatures drove where they lived. This could mean that there are biological differences between sauropods and other dinosaurs. The researchers suggested that sauropods relied more on their environment to keep warm, which is different from other dinosaurs. And, of course, they had features to keep them cool, like the larger surface area with the long necks and the tails, and a respiratory system similar to birds, which was very efficient. Other dinosaurs, they had feathers to keep them warm, but there's no evidence that sauropods had feathers. And then, of course, as you mentioned, Garrett, we talked about the, keeping the nests warm and how sauropods did that differently compared to, say, theropods that use their body heat. The team also found that big climate changes before the late Cretaceous, while they affected dinosaurs and their patterns, quote, appear to have had no large-scale or prolonged negative effects on the group's diversity, end quote. And dinosaurs were highly adaptable. Until, of course, the Chicxulub impact event which was a major event that happened suddenly, so there was no time to adapt. Yeah, that's for sure. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. If you'd like to see any of the links to the news stories we shared or from our interview, then head over to inodino.com. Thanks for listening, and until next time. 
Good day.